Hey guys, I'm Tom the Tech Chap, and in this video, I want to give you some of my tips and also recommendations for what the best monitor or display is to pair with your MacBook, whether it's your shiny MacBook Pro 14 or 16, or your Air, or really just any laptop. Whether you want something budget friendly or with pro level color accuracy, for gaming maybe, or even just you want the best overall bang for your buck. I have also timestamped this video if you want to jump ahead and also uh, I'll leave links to my recommended displays in the description below. And if you enjoyed the video, a cheeky like and subscribe would be lovely. Okay, first things first, how much do you need to spend? Well, you can go from a couple of hundred quid up to the best part of seven grand. So it's important to figure out what features you actually need. So you've got to consider what you're going to use it for. If it's just a second screen for having Discord on the side or watching movies or something, it probably doesn't need to be this Apple Pro Display XDR. But then if you're color grading and video editing, then you are going to want something with pro level color accuracy. But before we get to all that, the most important thing really, and also probably the most boring thing, is this the cables, the connections. So right now, I've got a MacBook Pro 16 via this Thunderbolt Pro cable, which we'll come back to in a second, uh, paired up to this 6K Apple Pro Display XDR. This is a lovely setup, would highly recommend if you've got like nine grand to spare between the two of them. Uh, so that's not gonna be for everyone. Without getting too bogged down, the best and most expensive monitors will offer a Thunderbolt port, and that gets you the highest resolution and refresh rates, including data transfer, and it'll also charge your laptop, which means you can have fewer cables and you can keep your desk nice and tidy. However, if you're on more of a budget, then regular USB-C ports, HDMI, or DisplayPort will be more than good enough for most of us. They all have pros and cons and different limitations, and hopefully this table will give you a bit of an idea of what each one can do. I'm telling you, this stuff can get very complicated and could probably have a whole video just dedicated to talking about the difference between HDMI 2 and 2.1 and USB-C and Thunderbolt. It's a lot. So all recent MacBooks from the last few years have USB-C ports that support Thunderbolt 3 or 4, and effectively they are the same thing. Again, a whole video could be on that. There are differences, but they have the same Mac speed, and what we're talking about today are basically the same. So you've got Thunderbolt on your MacBook. You then need a Thunderbolt cable or a high bandwidth USB-C cable, and then also a Thunderbolt display to give you the best of the best. We do also now get an HDMI 2 port on these latest MacBook Pro 14s and 16s, which isn't as good as Thunderbolt, but it can still get you 4K60 and HDR. Now, of course, a screen like this doesn't have an HDMI input, so you'll have to use an adapter, but you're still limited by what's being output through this. So at a very high level, you've got Thunderbolt 3 and 4, which is the best, really. You've got HDMI 2.1, which is quite rare, especially on monitors. Uh, it's more common on TVs, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, and then you've got sort of DisplayPort, which can come with the USB-C. And then you've got just normal USB-C, no DisplayPort, no Thunderbolt, which can do sort of 4K60 and some charging, but not the same full amount of charging. And then you've got the sort of lowest tier, HDMI 2.0, which as I say, can still get you 4K60. That wasn't simple at all, was it? <laughs> it is very complicated. Uh, so it is worth reading reviews and also looking at specs for the particular monitor you're looking for. So there's nothing wrong with a good old HDMI 2 monitor. They are the most common, the most affordable, but mostly for this video, I'll be recommending uh, ones with USB-C with external display support or Thunderbolt 3 or 4. So let's move on and talk about size. And 24 inches is still the most popular by far, but personally, I think a 27 inch screen is the sweet spot without being too big for your desk or too expensive. Now for me, bigger is pretty much always better. And with this 32 inch screen, or indeed even that 38 inch ultra wide I've got over there, you've just got more space for your apps, whether you're having sort of side by side multitasking or you just want a more immersive experience. 16 by 9 monitors are still the most common, but taller 16 by 10 ratios give you a bit more vertical space. Or as I say, you can go ultra wide with a 21 by 9 or 21 by 10 like I've got here, or even a super duper 32 by 9 ultra wide if you've got a massive desk and just want to go nuts. The next thing to think about is resolution, because you don't want to pair your shiny, lovely MacBook or whatever laptop you're using with a low quality, low res display, which just looks kind of rubbish when you've got them next to each other. So 1080p Full HD is absolutely fine on a 24 inch monitor, but anything bigger, definitely try and get 1440p or Quad HD for a much sharper picture. And if you need to see even finer detail, then go for 4K. It's absolutely worth it for graphical or video work. And outside of gaming, because it'll just destroy your frame rate, there isn't really a downside to 4K, except maybe it's a bit more expensive. 
Then there's panel type. So rule of thumb, avoid TN panels. You don't see them as much these days, but they're pretty cheap and also not very good at all. The best overall, I would say, is IPS. You get good viewing angles, great color accuracy, but it is also worth considering VA. They often have better contrast, even higher brightness, uh, but at the cost of some accuracy. And then occasionally you'll run into a mini LED or an OLED option, which also have their own pros and cons and are generally a lot more expensive. It's also important to consider the color accuracy, which means what you see on screen is truer to what you'd see in real life, and then more representative of what others will see when looking at or watching your content. So having a monitor with at least 100% sRGB, and ideally a 90% or higher Adobe RGB and DCI-P3 is preferable. Some monitors like this, and also the ultra wide, which I use pretty much every day actually, have dedicated color profiles. You can go into the uh, display settings and then change to sRGB or uh, Adobe RGB or P3, and then you can edit your content that way. Now this video is very kindly sponsored by the lovely people over at Surfshark VPN. Because I've been using Surfshark for years and I always have it installed on my laptop, phone, pretty much everything, and actually one account lets you use an unlimited number of devices. And essentially, a VPN hides your IP address, and together with their clean web tool, you can browse the web more safely, and it helps to prevent tracking, malware ads, and other nasty stuff. Plus, you can access region-locked content. So for me, jumping between, say, UK and US Netflix is actually really useful. But the best bit is if you click the link in the description below or use the code TECHCHAP at the checkout, you get a massive 84% off and four months extra for free with a full 30-day money-back guarantee. So why not give Surfshark VPN a try? And the last thing to think about before we come to my recommended models is the refresh rate. And normally this isn't something most people think about, especially when it comes to second external displays, especially for productivity. But since Apple introduced the 120 Hertz promotion on these new MacBooks, which we also have on the likes of the Surface Pro 8 and the MSI Creator Z16, more and more Pro laptops are now offering high refresh rates. And so as good as this is, and it is very good as you'd hope for well, six and a half grand top spec. But bear in mind, you're gonna have your nice smooth 120 hertz on here, and then on your second screen, it's gonna feel slower because you're gonna go back down to 60, which is why some monitors, again, like the one I've got over there, are also high refresh, it's 144 hertz. So going between the two screens feels more seamless, and it's just a bit nicer to use when it's a lot smoother. So that's worth bearing in mind, but realistically, you're still fine with 60 hertz. Yes, it won't be quite as smooth, especially as we've been now spoiled by this, but the vast majority of productivity and work laptops are 60. It's very rare to get something at high refresh unless it's more gaming oriented. Oh, and also don't forget that if you have a recent iPad, you can actually use the sidecar feature to make it a second screen for your MacBook. It's completely wireless and of course, very portable. It's an iPad, so you can bring it with you. Okay, so that is all the background stuff. Let's talk about some of my recommended monitors. There's no room on my desk for this. Uh, this is the Dell UltraSharp U2720Q, and it is probably my favorite all RAM monitor right now. It is a couple of years old, hopefully they do an update soon. And it's not exactly a budget option, but in terms of image quality, connectivity, and features, it's a pretty easy recommendation. The 4K resolution looks sharp on the 27-inch IPS panel. It's got great color accuracy, the Display HDR 400 spec is kind of the entry point for HDR, but it's still nice to have. Downsides, well, there's no Thunderbolt 3 support. Uh, it is also 60 Hertz, and it doesn't get quite tall enough uh, to sit above my MacBook screen without having to go on a stand. Although the 14 should be fine, and I think overall it's a solid buy. My other favorite is this ASUS ProArt PA278CV, which is around half the price of the Dell, but it's not far behind in terms of quality. Now, I don't have one in the studio with me right now, but I've tried it before and I think it's great. And it's also a 27 inch IPS, although it drops resolution from 4K to 1440, and color accuracy is a little bit lower, but still impressive. And you can also switch between different calibration profiles. Viewing angles and response times are great, and it even outperforms the Dell with a higher 75 Hertz refresh rate with Adaptive Sync VRR, so everything feels a bit smoother. There's USB-C connectivity, although again, not Thunderbolt, but you do get 65 watt charging, although the Dell did offer 90. There's also no HDR support, and overall contrast is a bit average, but it's still a good option overall. Alternatively, Dell's S2722 DC is a similar price and spec, and is a more affordable version of the U2720Q. This is a really good choice if you prefer the Dell design language, although I think ASUS probably has the edge when it comes to color accuracy. 
If you're on a tighter budget, then check out the ViewSonic VP2458 for around 200 to 225 pounds, or cheaper still, this Dell S2421NX. I know it's another Dell, but you can get this for about 160 pounds. It is 24 inches, full HD, and you're not getting any of the fancy bells and whistles. But you know, if you just want a second screen to have your Excel spreadsheets or have a better YouTube on the side of something, this is a really good affordable option. And it's also worth mentioning, if you are just gonna go with a full HD 24 inch display, then you don't have to worry about any of this connectivity stuff, in fact, the first third of this video, because you can get everything you need just through a basic HDMI port, which you can either do straight from the HDMI port on the new MacBooks or via a USB-C adapter. But what about me? What do I actually use? Well, I would consider this, but it is far too expensive. So I use that, the LG 38WN95C. The huge 38 inch size and taller 32 by 10 aspect makes it feel a bit less letterboxy than most ultra wides. Plus we get decent HDR, Thunderbolt 3, surprisingly good speakers, impressive color accuracy, and a 144 Hertz refresh rate with G-Sync and FreeSync. It is quite expensive at about 1500 pounds or so, and it can be a little tricky to find stock. But for my money, it is not only the best monitor for pairing with your MacBook, but it's just the best monitor hands down. Although bear in mind, while ultra wides and even super ultra wides offer a lot more horizontal space than immersion, they do take up a lot more desk space, especially curved models. And also videos and some games will have large black bars either side. But as good as that is, it is not professionally color accurate. In fact, very few monitors actually are in terms of the sort of mainstream display market. But this is also worth considering, the Apple Pro Display XDR. As I say, it starts from about four and a half thousand pounds. And if you want to add this nano texture coating, which makes it more matte, and also this stand, you're looking at an extra grand a piece. Together, this is about six and a half thousand pounds, which obviously is an eye-watering amount of money, but if you're buying this as an investment for your business, for your work, uh, then maybe it is worth the investment. It's a 32 inch 6K 1600 nit peak brightness monitor with fantastic contrast and also a true 10 bit color panel, which is quite rare. And also the build quality and style are what you'd expect from Apple. This thing is a thing of beauty. And there are a couple of areas maybe that it's starting to fall behind technically. Uh, for example, it is still using an IPS LCD display, whereas we have the mini LED on the MacBook. So actually we get a higher contrast on here, although this does a really good job uh, for what it is. It's also 60 Hertz still, again, 120 Hertz over here. So in a couple of ways, maybe it doesn't quite keep up with the brand spanking new screens on these MacBooks, but then we do have other advantages like it's 32 inches, and also because of this uh, cooling and actually the two active fans inside, which you don't really hear very often, it can sustain the higher brightness for longer than even the MacBook. So actually this peaks at 1600, uh, generally looking at 1000 for HDR, although UI generally like this is 500 nits. And apparently that's something people complained about when they bought this, is that why am I not getting that full 1000 nits all the time? Well, the answer to that is in Mac OS, the UI is always limited to 500 nits, but when it detects HDR content like YouTube videos or uh, your workflow in Lightroom or Premiere or DaVinci or File Cut, then for the content, it'll boost it up to 1000 or 1600 nits peak, and that's how that works. And also we do have different color profiles on this as well. It is absolutely stunning though, and I kind of would recommend if you can, I mean, you're paying this much anyway, to go for that nano texture glass. It does really give you that matte effect. And interestingly, rather than just putting a matte film over the top, or or an extra layer like most displays, they actually etch into the glass to scatter the light and reduce reflections. Alternatively, the LG Ultrafine OLED Pro is a mere four grand, and again, this is aimed at professionals, but the OLED screen offers perfect black levels as each pixel can turn itself off individually, and they're fantastic at displaying vivid and accurate colors. The LG also gets USB-C with display and 90 watt power delivery and plenty of adjustability. Slightly more reasonably priced though is the still great 40 inch Dell UltraSharp U4021QW. And if you're into photo work, then the BenQ SE321C photo view has great color accuracy, a big 32 inch 4K screen and USB-C. As for gaming, well, this probably isn't your number one priority, particularly if you have a Mac. Yes, you have the Apple Arcade, some games on the Steam library, and maybe even you could stream it through GeForce Now or Xbox Cloud Gaming, but generally most people don't play a lot of games on the Mac. But if you are gaming, then of course, all of these will be fine, but to get the best experience, you're gonna want a high refresh, ideally 144 hertz or above refresh rate. 
And finally, what about using your TV as an external screen instead? So TVs use HDMI inputs, so you'll need to connect directly to HDMI on your laptop or via USB-C to HDMI adapter. And actually, TVs are a cheaper route to bigger screen sizes, but they can take up a lot more space on your desk, and sitting up close to one, it can be tricky to see everything. Also, if you're using an older 1080p TV, then sitting up close won't do the sharpness any favors. And also, slower pixel response times can make the motion on some TVs blurrier than regular monitors. But then if you're sitting at a distance with a long adapter cable, then the extra size could be useful. So those are some of my top picks. And if you think I've missed out any great options or you've got any recommendations, let me know in the comments below. And also if you've got any questions, hopefully you found this video useful. And if you wanna see more from me, then hit that subscribe button below. And I will see you next time right here on The Tech Chat. Thanks for watching. Oh, and don't forget, check out Surfshark VPN and use the code TECHCHAP or click the link below to get 84% off, four months extra for free, and in my opinion, the best VPN on the market.